All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for holding on while we were getting settled in here today. Um, this is Heather Wood here at the Division of Behavioral Health, and today we're going to have a training on waitlist expectations and introduction um, instructions, rather, for the entry into the Division of Behavioral Health Centralized Data System. So we thank you all for joining today. Today I'm joined here by Sue Adams, also from the Division. Sue is our Network Administrator, and then Hannah Murdoch. So this morning, we're going to go through um, some base in information for you. Um, so let's go ahead and we'll get started. A couple of reminders and um, a couple of things for introduction. We will be taking note of the folks who have joined based upon the participant list that we have. If you have several people who are dialing in in one room or under one conference line, um, please go ahead and you can enter in additional names in the chat box so that that way we're able to capture all attendees. Also, today's training is going to be recording and it will be available in the system documentation and training section of the CDS um, probably sometime just after noon today. There will also be a couple of new documents and resources in there for you um, regarding creating an encounter as well as capacity. All right, well, let's get started with today's call. Um, if you have questions, Please go ahead and enter those into the chat function, as folks may have realized. Um, we have put folks on mute, just so that that way we can get through the training and so that we have a better recording. So for today, we're going to review the Division of Behavioral Health Authority and what the waitlist expectations are as a result of the authority and with power comes all the responsibilities. So we're going to talk through those. Also talk about the required services for waitlist entry into the CDS. Um, we're going to talk about the previous process that providers had been um, completing each week and what the role of the provider, the region, and DBH was in that versus the new process. And then we're going to review the actual entry steps for entering someone into the CDS and placing them onto the waitlist and removing them from the waitlist. And then I'll give a um, brief demonstration of a few test case scenarios to be able to give um, just the explanation actually in our test environment. And then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Okay, good morning everyone, this is Sue. Um, the beginning um, of our presentation, as Heather said, is really to talk about the Division of Behavioral Health Authority um, to ask you to complete a wait list. And um, I think that this information has been distributed before, so I'm going to hit it just lightly, but really um, our Nebraska Administrative Code um, 206, Chapter 3, uh, really talks about the expectation for the state behavioral health authority to ensure, authority to ensure the statewide availability of an appropriate array of recovery-oriented and person-centered community-based behavioral health services. Um, so when we look at that, it, it really is um, an authority for us to make sure that there is access to service. Um, and it does not really um, talk about for um, persons who are um, available or who are eligible for DBH, but really talks about that overall authority of the state. Um, so we think that that's important to recognize. And then um, the second uh, component is really talking about the federal code um, and our block grant requirement um, to make sure that um, there is capacity for our priority populations. Um, and one of the ways of doing that is a waitlist management system. Now we recognize that is for substance abuse block grant um, funds, but we still believe that it supports our authority to ask. Um, before we go any further, or you can go ahead and move slide, um, Heather, um, I do want to talk um, or to recognize that there are some folks right now um, who are in a position of struggling with um, the avail availability to fill out um, the wait list in the manner that um, we've asked um, because of um, uh, congruence with HIPAA. Uh, or compliance with HIPAA regulations. Um, we are not going to be discussing that today. I will just tell you that we recognize right now that that is an issue for some providers and that that is something that will be um, uh, addressed by the regional administrators and by others. Um, we also recognize that you uh, work with your um, legal services to dictate what you do, but that is not going to be the focus of the conversation today. 
uh, the focus of the conversation today is whatever has landed on that you have an understanding of what the expectations are for what services um, and then also um, when things are, are completed and, and how it's done. So this is really more of a, a technical assistance in the weeds um, type of presentation to make sure you know how to do the wait list. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is, again, right now we are um, asking folks to include all consumers waiting for con contracted services, recognizing that that has um, not fully been addressed by our leadership at this time. The second component is really what is a wait list and who should be on a wait list. And so um, we think it's important to recognize that you aren't put on a wait list until you have been assessed to really need the level of service requested. Um, and so if somebody is referred to an agency and they haven't had an assessment, um, but they say, I think I might need short-term res, um, you would not put that person on the short-term res wait list until they have been assessed to need that level of service. Um, Again, you cannot be admitted to the service immediately due to the lack of capacity in a service. And so um, if there is the availability of the service, even, um, you know, you are scheduled an admission, you would not need to go on the wait list. So if it's um, a couple of days, but you are able to um, say, yes, we do have access or capacity to serve you, um, then you would not go on the wait list. Um, the third thing is that um, uh, you are available to be admitted to the service. So again, if you are in prison um, and you think that, you know, that you've been determined that you need a level of care, but if that bed or that slot was available tomorrow and you could not go to that slot, you would not be included on the wait list. And one thing to add to that, really as kind of a guide for the incarceration piece, if someone has a release date and it's within two week time period, they could then be placed onto that wait list with that wait list confirmation date given that the service is appropriate. However, if it extends out from there, you might want to have them on with a referral date, but not yet that wait list confirmation date if a release date is still pending. Mm -hmm. And Heather pointed out to me that I actually jumped a slide, so I, <laughs> I appreciate, um, again, um, looking at who should be put on the wait list and who does not need to go on a wait list. Um, and um, for individuals that are eligible for region funding, the account can be created using the information um, designated in the CDS to go on the wait list. Um, for persons who are not anticipated to be funded by DBH, a unique identifier in the creation of an encounter will protect the health information while allowing the wait list to unduplicate the number of consumers waiting for the service. So we really think it's important um, for us to be able to unduplicate. Um, again, we recognize that this hasn't been resolved, um, but we do want to say that right now um, this is the direction we're heading. So um, just an understanding that we think that it, it's very important for us as a system to be able to um, capture information with the wait list and um, there, if you have questions about somebody who should go on the wait list, you can certainly contact us. And just one other thing to um, kind of help to understand some of the questions that we get. You know, it's legislative season and we get a lot of inquiries from senators regarding wait times, regarding what service needs are, and certainly they have a lot of um, ability to influence budget decisions. And so when we're placed with those questions, it's really important that we have the most accurate and complete information to be able to offer to them, specifically speaking about the needs of our service system. And so if we don't have full comprehensive understanding of the wait times, of the number of individuals waiting for services, regardless of payer source, we've got very limited information to be able to offer them, or we have information that really doesn't speak to the overall need. So again, just something else to con consider. And so we'll get into some different examples again, speaking to that unique identifier in times when you know someone is not going to be eligible for the Division of Behavioral Health or Region funding, However, we want to be able to track and include them in our overall counts, as Sue had just mentioned. Thanks, Heather. I think that is very important, and that, you know, maybe is um, a motivation for folks to recognize the importance of that wait list because it is able to help us demonstrate need. So um, we've gotten a question, um, and so before we go into the services required, um, Sue, we got a question. 
and it has to do with who needs to conduct an assessment of the level of need. Would it have to be a behavioral health provider or could it be a medical provider? Um, and I would say that, um, you know, we have, <laughs> on the substance use side, um, we have um, the ASAM criteria, which we would expect somebody would um, need to use. So if it is um, on the substance use disorder side, we would want whoever completed that to have an understanding of ASAM um, and to be able to designate and, you know, assess the person according to the ASAM criteria. Um, on the mental health side, um, I guess it, it uh, looks a little bit different because um, it depends on where an individual is presenting. Um, so um, I, I would think that, you know, for our higher levels of care, um, besides um, acute or subacute, which, you know, certainly would be at a hospital, a person would have to have a, an understanding, again, of our service definitions um, and our uh, utilization criteria. Um, to assess the level of care and, of course, then um, to have that be within their scope of practice. And if providers or individuals on the call have questions about that, both on our public website for Division of Behavioral Health, we have a copy of the Utilization Guidelines, um, also known as our LIME book, L-I-M-E, yes, as in the fruit, um, which describes the color of paper that it's been printed on to distinguish it from our previous yellow book. But that being said, it's also in the CDS under system documentation and training section. And so if there's any questions that you have about the expectations for what is required at admission or even continued stay, that's a really great document to be able to look at. As Sue mentioned, there's some additional criteria for our higher levels of service or those authorized service. That would include going through the authorization process, which includes the questionnaire both for substance use and mental health and the process that is within the CVS to gain the authorization approval. Right, and, and that really is, you know, where we would lead so that the uh, information and the assessment um, should be conducted in such a way that it does allow you then to be able to take information and to enter into the CDS for authorization. So it's really important that whoever is uh, completing that assessment understands that that's what's going to be needed. Okay, um, the next um, uh, slide addresses the services required for waitlist entry. And so um, we did have a lot of conversation about um, what services we want, and we recognize that although it would be nice to have um, waiting lists for things like outpatient or medication management, it really gets messy. Um, we heard that from you, we, we understand that, and so we um, selected services that we believe there is a, a high level of need um, that typically oftentimes we believe have a wait list um, and that it's, um, you're, you're able to, um, as, to look at that service and say, yes, we have a slot or we don't have a slot. Again, it, it, when we talked about some of the outpatient services. So again, those services would be ACT, um, both uh, mental health and SUD community support, day treatment, um, dual residential, um, respite, professional partner, all levels, um, Cyprus rehab, secure residential, supported employment and supported housing, um, halfway house, uh, uh, intensive outpatient um, for SUD, um, intermediate residential, short-term residential and therapeutic community. Now, going back into um, some of the services that are duly funded, and um, I'm gonna push a little bit right here. Um, it's difficult uh, really to get a true picture of a wait list if you are keeping both an SUD and a mental health dual residential wait list. Um, what we would want you to do is to, to have one wait list for that service. And so, um, Heather, I'm, I don't know that we have discussed this thoroughly, but the, the um, understanding would be that we would have one wait list, which we may designate as on the mental health side, um, that that is where the wait list would, would exist, although we recognize that, um, you know, somebody may be admitted under the SUD um, side of, of the program. So if you've got 16 beds and you want to reflect how much, um, you know, who's on the wait list, you would put everybody on the mental health wait list and we're just going to default to that right now. So there was a question that came in and it is, is it required for outpatient mental health and SUD? And the answer is no. 
And so one other thing to add to that, and you'll see on the left-hand side of the slide here, beginning no later than April 1st, 2018. So that is in reference to any of these services. If you have been adding people to the wait list, which we know some folks have been, that's great. Keep up that work. Um, and so you've already exceeded the expectation with the April 1st timeframe. But the other thing is, if you have other services that for your management of a wait list or of you know, just being able to track, you can add anyone to the wait list for any service where it's appropriate. So just because it's not required and one of the services that Sue has gone through on this list, certainly the features are there and you are welcome to use that. Again, you might find that it has a lot of utility in helping to manage a wait list, even if it's on a service that's not on this list and not being required, um, again, but you can use it for any of the services that are within CDS. So I'm gonna just review quickly what the previous process that folks had been completing was compared to how it will be now. Um, so the old reporting process was a very manual, time-consuming, and honestly, a week-long activity between all of the different um, folks who had a hand in it. And so providers would go through, enter in different information for each of the individuals at their um, location by the services, and they would send that then and have that information submitted to the regions who would aggregate that information. That information needed to come into the Division of Behavioral Health. From there, we would aggregate it into the different state list along with all of the different regions and compiling one big summary report, which then we would send out to the regions and again, because of each of these different steps and all of these different handoffs, anytime something got updated or was found to be in error, it created even more rework during the course of a very short week. And what tended to happen was we kept getting behind. Um, and so that really wasn't the most efficient or effective way to be able to capture the information for who's waiting for services and being able to really have confidence in the ability to summarize that and to be able to provide information to other interested parties. So the other thing that um, you know we really wanna make sure of is that we have something that it's not just an activity to try and satisfy some reporting need, but really that it's useful information. So as the regions are looking across their networks, they're having the ability to get in to see how many folks are waiting for a given service to see what they can do to help um, with the timeliness of being able to get into that. They have contacts across regions that they might be looking to some of their region um, cohort to be able to think about services that might be offered in another region, perhaps. So anyways, the new process that we have really looks to be more effective in the timeliness of being able to have that information as well as the accessibility of the information to all of the interested parties um, across providers, regions, and the division, so that that way we can have information that is accurate and up to date at any given time. So providers put it into the CDS, and then at the same time that providers have access to that information, so would the regions who have permission to view that provider's information, as would the Division of Behavioral Health. So a couple of things real quick before we go on to the actual steps of adding someone to the wait list. Just some reminders of why we want to make sure that we're keeping a wait list management system. And really it has to come, it comes down to ensuring that individuals are able to receive timely access to services, making sure, as Sue had mentioned before, that we're in compliance with state and federal requirements on the placement of priority populations in particular, and how they're placed into those treatment services, including the provision of interim services, and that's that federal interim definition. Really, if we've got someone who's pregnant or IV injecting, that they're being given the educational information that is federally required. So providers who are receiving funding that is block grant funding, funding included, um, really we have a lot of provisions that we have to ensure that we're in compliance with so that we're not at risk of losing that money. It's millions of dollars that could be at stake. Um, certainly that money helps to be able to offer resources and services to the consumers in Nebraska. The other thing is we wanna make sure that we're able to reduce the length of time for any client and as they're waiting for services to the best of our ability, um, making sure that folks are being placed into appropriate recommended treatment services as soon as possible, and also that 
the information um, is there and providing necessary um, details for planning coordination and allocating resources. We're in the midst of budget planning for the next fiscal year. And so again, this information becomes really valuable for regions and for the division to be able to make those budgetary decisions. So let's talk a bit about the steps of getting someone into the wait list. So this is a document that also will have up. You might want to print it later to have kind of that visual um, reminder or use as a reference document. The training, as I had mentioned before, will also be up there. Um, so both of those will be a resource that you can go back to at a future date, or if there were folks who weren't able to join today, um, certainly you could point them in that direction that they would have information to. So I'm going to walk through just some screenshots first, and then we'll get into the demonstration. So the first step is always creating a new encounter. And with our January updates in the CDS, this began to look a little bit different. Our vendor, H4 Technology and Orion Healthcare Technology, have created basically a master patient index for us that does a lot of work behind the scenes to help with the data integrity and to help with the matching of elements across regions, across providers, across the state. Um, so that that way when we're looking at having unduplicated counts and we're looking at someone's true episode of care across the service continuum, we're doing as good of a job as we can to have that um, information for an individual be very, very specific. So um, we're excited about this new feature, but it does create a little bit of um, work for all of us to just be able to get in and get familiar with. Um, but it's really very easy to use. So when you go to the Create a New Encounter tab, when you first come into the CDS, you'll see the, the box on the right-hand side. And this allows you to either do a search or to create a new patient record. If you have the consumer or client ID, you could put that in. But because this is something that is generated by the CDS, if you don't have that specific number because the consumer had been in previously and you already had the number for them, don't insert anything there. You'll focus on the last name, first name, date of birth, and the social security number. If you have zip code and gender, that helps to be able to add confidence to the connection um, behind the scenes, but again, that information is not required. Um, again, you'll want to focus on the last name, first name, date of birth, and social security number for creating that new encounter. So once you begin to put information in and create a new encounter, you'll see what's on the right-hand side of the screen that allows you to then get into who you are as a service provider, who or what region, rather, is funding that service for that individual and what the service to be provided is at your location. Once the encounter is created, the individual can be added to the wait list. So you'll see the top um, row of buttons that are options. So here in this example, we've got add to the wait list, submit for authorization, cancel without an admission, and then remove the encounter. Um, and again, it's just a nice reminder to be able to save as you are updating information. But again, just a reminder that this wait list occurs after the assessment and the determination of the appropriate level of care has been made. You may not have yet submitted for authorization or gotten an authorization approval. But again, that your clinical team, the folks who are your experts of making those determinations, that series of steps has been done to determine that the individual is eligible and it's an appropriate level of care. Um, also, just one reminder, and you'll see this as we go through the slides, that the consumer data in these examples is fake. And again, when we get into the test environment, we'll be using fake data. So the entry fields for the wait list, once you add to the wait list and select that button, as was shown on the previous slide, you have this wait list field form. So basically, you're putting in a waitlist service confirmation date, so when you knew it was an appropriate service for this individual, and also recognizing that you don't currently have capacity or um, the individual is not able to come in and you want to place them there, an appropriate placement onto the waitlist, you would put that into the waitlist service confirmation date. Also, any priority population that they might be, and there's a priority population list specific to our mental health services as well as our substance use disorder services. If they have a mental health board status, regardless of what um, type of service you are providing, that information can be placed in as well as a commitment date if applicable. And then the interim, the federal interim service delivery date. So again, that is not the engagement service, um, but really it is about the delivery of those education materials 
um, specified within that federal interim service. If you um, want more information on that, there's been previous presentations or um, you can reach out to us um, following this presentation and we can get you more information on the federal interim services. The engagement service is the service type that while someone is waiting, they might, you might have, um, or they may have, or another provider may have initiated, um, oftentimes likely with the region's help as well, um, to be able to keep them engaged while they're waiting and to be able to offer some type of supportive service. service. Um, also, if there's anything additional that is being used to help engage the client, you can put that into the text box that's there. You can put in when the assessment date um, of, you know, that um, current assessment that had been done, when that date was. If you had a referral date, so I had talked about if you have someone who might be incarcerated, but their um, release date is pending, um, you might have a referral date that would be appropriate to have um, just tracking when they first came into kind of your knowledge, or if you had a referral from a parole officer or someone else, that might be appropriate for a referral date. One other thing to note is that while supported housing is a required service for wait list, they do have some different descriptions for um, some of the definitions of what these dates mean in order to be able to track um, the access to services. So there's different information that is specific to supported housing. So as I'm talking about these descriptions, really it's not in connection with the supported housing, but rather all other services that would be using wait lists. We also have the referral source, which is important information for us to understand where folks are coming from. And then once you have an offer date or the admit date, that can be entered. And then also important to note who the primary funding source would be. Following the entry of um, that information, you would click add to the wait list. Also just want to make note that in April, um, we will have another option that will be um, added to this form, and that is about faith-based request or charitable choice. We don't typically, within the course of a year, have a lot of notation about that, but again, because it is a federal requirement, we want to make sure that we have a way, besides just the notes section um, on this form, that you would be able to capture that information. All right, so we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one is, is the social security number required to begin the encounter? Um, it is no longer required. Again, part of that is due to some of the background information, and it will come up with a variety of um, individuals who might closely match that name um, and birth date information. From that list, you might be able to select someone who you know is the appropriate person. But again, it's based on user permissions, and so you're going to have some restrictions in what that listing will pull up for you. And that expands based upon, you know, the scope of your permissions. So for instance, someone at your region um, might be able to offer a bit of assistance if they have some additional information um, to be able to help determine an appropriate um, fit for that. But really, you should be working to be able to include as much information and as specific of information on social security number and date of birth as possible. They're important fields, they always have been, in order to be able to match and to be able to help unduplicate across services so that that way we have a true count of individuals at any time. Um, there's an, a, a comment about <clears throat> needing to enter an engagement service before adding to the wait list. However, it's not required. There are options where it's not applicable or other, and so you can use those other options. It doesn't have to be a specific service type that you would be indicating. Um, we also had another question about summary reports, and I'll get into that um, more towards the end of this slide deck. And there's a question that if an individual is referred to halfway house while they are currently in short-term residential, would their engagement service be residential treatment um, for that current service level until they can be discharged and then admitted to the next service? I guess for me, it's, it's, if they are already in service and being treated, you could put that in there, but truly it's, you know, it's, it's 
it's treatment, it's not engaging somebody to remain in I mean, part of that would be the, the treatment orientation, but I would not see if somebody's going straight from halfway house to short term or short term res to halfway house, there wouldn't necessarily even um, be the need for an engagement service. I mean, you could put that on there if you want. Um, but to me, it's more about what keeps somebody engaged in recovery while they're waiting to receive treatment. Well, if they're already in treatment, then they wouldn't, that wouldn't apply. And that's something that we can talk a little bit further with the regions about mm -hmm. and get consistency. Um, yep. But again, a couple of options, as Sue said, you could put that service of short-term residential or residential treatment rather in there or not applicable if they have a um, clear kind of path between those and their in-service. So um, there's another question about the social security number and that before we had required social security number and then if they didn't have that, we'd have the ID generator. So again, this kind of takes away that need to have the ID generator with the social security number as the system itself with the um, master patient index is working to be able to complete those social security numbers as it has different matches in the background. But again, to the best of your ability, get that information um, and please do your due diligence to be able to have accurate and complete information on the individuals who you're entering. All right, so I'm going to keep going on and then we'll get to some of these additional questions um, before we get into the demonstration. So um, again, just a reminder about the importance of entering in that federal interim service delivery date and then the engagement service or additional um, engagement. So there again, if you put, you could add a, a comment also about um, currently in this treatment level. So once you've completed all the different waitlist fields, um, you'll have the status which has all the information and that person is then in that encounter status of pre-admitted waitlisted. And as you go into the encounter, you'll be able to, as circled here in red in this example, see waitlist is now a tab that you can revisit and be able to update different information for that individual if you were to go to that tab. Um, the other tab that has been added then all is the contact lab, the contact log where you can go in and record each of the contact dates, what the results of that contact was, if there was an offer to admit date or the offer response and any additional notes. And then you would simply hit record new contact um, to be able to save that information. And it's important that those contacts are being made throughout the course of an individual's wait time, um, both for your tracking purposes as well as, again, additional engagement to keep the communication clear with that individual and help them to have a clear understanding of when they might be able to be placed within your treatment. So to remove from waitlist, you would click on the remove from waitlist button. And from there, you'll have um, just a few fields, um, simple completion of when the removal date from the waitlist is, what the removal reason is, and then again, if there's any update to the mental health board status or commitment dates, and then any additional notes that you might want to put. So then you click remove from waitlist. And just real quick, um, I wanted to demonstrate the list of the removal reasons. And so you'll see the list that's currently there, admitted to program, admitted to other program. So say for instance, you have someone who is um, it admitted to your waitlist and also admitted to another waitlist and maybe the other program was able to get them in um, more quickly than you were able to so they were admitted but it was not to your program and then we've got the different options cannot be located, refused treatment, succeeding at a lower level of care, requires a higher level of care, decrease or I'm sorry deceased, incarcerated or no longer qualifies for the program and just a note, in April, one of the additions that we'll have, and part of this has to do with some of those folks who we know are not DBH or region funded, but we do want to have included on the wait list. Um, beginning with the implementation of April changes, you will have another option here for removal reason, which is admitted to program other funding. 
So again, that means that they are admitted to your program, but it's not to um, be included with the actual admit features within CVS. You will simply remove them from the wait list. And so here, following removal from the wait list, just to summarize some of the next steps, you're able to admit for registered services or submit for authorization for authorized services for those individuals who are eligible for division slash region funding. Um, you can cancel without an admission. So that would be a case where if someone is Medicaid um, and you've had them on the wait list, you admit to program other funding and then you cancel without an admission rather than going through an admission since you will actually be working with the Heritage Health Plan that's been selected in order to admit them into the service. Um, you can remove them from the remove the encounter if it's been an error, if you have duplicate entries for one person and really you want to make sure that they're only captured once. Um, and then also you can add to the wait list if they've come off the wait list and then they're placed back on. Um, say for instance, you have someone who was incarcerated, they had a release date, something happened, their release date got placed back, you remove them from the wait list, but then they come back and they have a new release date, you're able to again add them. So waitlist reporting, that was one of the questions that had been asked right now. You're able to go in and do a search by encounter status and you would select pre-admitted waitlisted and you can look at that information to be able to do a search and if you hit search, it will be able to display all of those individuals for a particular service or funding region. Um, if you have multiple locations that you have access to, you can look by the particular provider location it will display, based upon your search criteria, all of the individuals who are currently in that wait list status. You can also export the results, which allows you to save it into an Excel document. You could add additional fields um, within that Excel template for, again, better management of that wait list information. Um, it also gives you the ability to sort on status date or last update to find recent activity. So just um, to be able to have kind of a before and after, um, what you see on the left-hand side is when you were doing the manual submission of information through the spreadsheet, all of the different information that was required um, for the priority population submitted to the DBH weekly um, through your region. Um, and then also then on the left-hand side, what we have, and so you'll see that there's not a lot more fields than having just gone through all the different fields. It literally just takes a few minutes to be able to get in, if you've got the information in hand, to be able to put that in and add someone to the wait list. Um, so we'll also just note that for those individuals where um, they might be Medicaid funded and you don't feel comfortable putting in all of their PHI, for first name we would ask that you put in for exit, XXXX, for last name, um, you can construct an ID, which would be the first four characters of the last name and the last four numbers of their social security number, and then to put in their actual date of birth. Again, this helps us to be able, and your region staff to be able, to have a true count of individuals who are on the wait list, regardless of how many placements they might be on that wait list across different locations. Um, again, the social security number, if unknown or not DBH funded, you can now leave that blank. Um, the ID generator, really thinking about that consumer ID that is generated in, if you have that for that individual, you can put that into the client ID, but again, only if you have what has been already generated through the CDS for consumer or client ID. So in order to make sure we have enough time for our demonstration, I want to go ahead and jump into that and then we'll look back over the questions as well. So I'm going to go ahead now and get into our um, test site. And so give me just a second here. And just to introduce, we've got a few test case scenarios. So we've got Eddie Tesla and Eddie is waiting to be able to, or is waiting to be entered into a secure residential treatment service. Um, Eddie is eligible for DBH region funding. We have Mary Testerson, who is waiting for short-term residential, also eligible for DBH funded. She is not Medicaid eligible. She does not have private insurance. Um, and then we have Kayla Testbrook, 
who is waiting to enter into assertive community treatment, and Kayla is Medicaid eligible. So we'll just walk through these scenarios real quick. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen and jump over to um, our test environment. All right, so I've already logged into the test environment. Again, the test environment is going to be noted based upon these diagonal lines. So we're going to go in and we're going to create those three different examples. So for last name, um, again, Eddie Tesla is DBH funded. So we're going to put in Eddie's last name. We're going to put in his first name. We're going to go ahead and we're going to put in his date of birth. And um, I don't know his zip code. I do know that he's male. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put in his social security number. I'm going to create a new encounter. So I've got my information here. And I'm going to kind of quickly go through what um, I have as a very long list to be able to get to the level of care. But so um, he's waiting for secure residential. And he's waiting to be able to be admitted into telecare. So I'm creating this encounter. And then from there, I'm able to add Eddie to my wait list. And so I'm going to go ahead and I've confirmed today that he does meet criteria for placement into um, short term, or I'm sorry, secure residential. Um, he is not a priority population at this time. Um, Mental health board, there is no commitment. Um, interim service delivery date, because he is not one of those priority population types of IV injecting, um, certainly he's not pregnant. Um, I'm not putting in any interim service delivery date. Um, he is, however, engaged in some peer support, and that's helping him to stay engaged while he's waiting for secure residential. Um, and then also the assessment date was conducted on the 25th. And the referral date, he actually, we learned about him on the 21st. And the referral source was from a um, community program. And so we put that in. And I don't yet have an offer date. And the funding source, again, is State Behavioral Health Funds. So, I do that information and I am able to add Eddie to the wait list. Once Eddie is able to get in, I would be able to then remove him from the wait list. Um, I also have the ability, as I had mentioned, to go in and to update any of the wait list fields. I also have the contact log to be able to record all of the different contact um, sessions or dates that might have occurred, as well as the result, any offer date, offer result, and any notes that I would want to put in. Um, particularly if I might have trouble reaching Eddie um, while he's waiting for treatment. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do a second scenario. So our second scenario is for Mary Testerson. So I'm going to go ahead and Mary, again, is DBH funded. And Mary is waiting for short-term residential. I'm going to put in Mary's date of birth and her social security number, and her gender. And I'm creating a new encounter. And I'm able to put her in to um, the location. She's waiting for St. Francis, or I'm sorry, St. Monica's um, for short-term residential. So I create this. Um, and actually, she's also waiting for touchstone. Um, so, depending upon which of the providers gets her in, um, that might influence what the removal reason is. So, I'm going to go ahead and add her. And actually, um, we've known and had her on, her on our list, let's say, for a little while here. Um, she actually came on on the 21st. She is a priority population. Um, she's a woman with dependent children. Um, there is not a mental health status or commitment date. Um, but there were some um, things that we wanted to be able to give her in terms of education. Um, she was recently pregnant, and, and just some of the things that we know about Mary, we wanted to make sure to offer this to her. her. And so, in fact, um, that was delivered yesterday. So we put that in. The engagement service, she's currently in outpatient 
level of care to keep her engaged. The assessment date was on the 12th. And um, we didn't necessarily have a referral date. She self-referred and um, we had been talking um, with her therapist in the meantime. So the referral source there was self. So we don't have an admit date, and again, she is eligible for our DBH region funding. So we add Mary to the wait list. So we've had an opening that's come up, and so we're actually going to remove her from the wait list. Um, but actually what we have found is that Touchstone was actually able to admit her first. So we're going to admit to other program, and we're going to have today's date as a removal date and remove her from the program. Even though she was waiting for two programs, if she was admitting to ours, we would select admit to program. But again, in this example, we're saying that Mary already had um, gotten access to be admit to, admitted to the Touchstone short-term residential program, so we will say admitted to other program. We're gonna remove her from the wait list, and then I'm actually going to go ahead um, and show you one last example here. So if we add the encounter, and this time we've got Kayla Testbrook. And so because she's Medicaid funded, I'm going to use that consumer ID. And so for first name, I'm going to put in the four X's. For her last name, I'm going to use a collection of the first four letters of her last name. So her last name is Testbrook. So I'm putting in T-E-S-D. And her social security number, um, the last four digits are 4567. So I'm putting that in, and I'm putting in her date of birth, which I do know. Whoops. Um, and I'm leaving the social security number blank, and I'm putting in the gender. So I'm recording or creating a new record. I've got this information here, and Kayla is waiting for act at center point peer location. So I'll go ahead and select that. I've got ACT community or assertive community treatment and I'm able to place her there. Um, I add her to the wait list, putting in the information as applicable and as we've gone through again, priority population. Um, again, if there's any relevant mental health, um, you can see here the options there. I do know that she's being discharged from the Lincoln Regional Center. Um, and so her mental health board status, again, that there currently is a mental health board inpatient level of commitment, but I know that that is coming to a close, so I would want to update that. But the prior inpatient commitment date had been um, in December, so I put that information in. Um, right now, really, there's not a need for the interim service delivery date. The engagement service is the inpatient level. Um, as they're keeping her while she's there. Um, but I'm just going to also say um, that she's currently in service at LRC. Um, the assessment date to be able to determine the act was appropriate, that took place in December, and the referral date also took place in December. The referral source was mental health service provider, and the funding source for her is going to be Medicaid. So I'm adding her to the wait list. So now I've got this information, and one last thing to point out. So the computer or the um, Compass system within the CDS actually generates this consumer ID of 31775683. So if, for instance, I have other things, if she comes off the wait list but at another time comes on, and I've got that documentation of that consumer ID, I can also use that to be able to enter an encounter. So that's going to conclude the demonstration um, component of our um, training here. So I'm going to stop sharing so I can go back to the um, questions and make sure that I spend the last couple of minutes answering any questions that you all might have. So real quickly here.
So there's a question about for outpatient services, what should be entered for the wait list required field? Um, for that, go ahead and for wait list slash service confirmation date. The date that you know, um, and folks might be familiar with this, when you have the admit form, so even if someone's not been on the wait list per se, there is that wait list service confirmation date. So the date that you knew that this was the appropriate level of care for someone and that they were coming in. So it might be the exact same date as that admit to service, or it might have been when they first called in um, to be able to make that appointment, to be able to see you. So that's what you will put in for those non-required services. And again, you wouldn't need to go through all of the steps of adding someone to the wait list, but when you admit them to that registered service, you could put it on the admit form. Um, if you don't have a release of information, is this a violation of CFR 42 to enter information for others to see? Again, this is um, a conversation that um, is, uh, would certainly occur between you and your uh, legal department. Um, there is also confirmation at um, the, um, or working at the division level, I think the regional administrators have had conversation about it. Um, I would remind uh, folks that um, this information or a fair amount of this information was um, for priority populations was submitted to us on paper um, previous to that time. And so, um, you know, there, there was, I believe, a certain level of comfort in, in uh, submitting that uh, information before. So I can't answer that question. Um, we have created a system that we um, believe um, would be in compliance, but again, we cannot make that judgment for you um, and your, your organization. So one other question about can you enter fake Social Security numbers? No, if you do not know the Social Security number or if this is someone who is Medicaid eligible, use the um, sort of discipline of creating that consumer ID based upon the first name and the last name convention that I've walked through, do not enter fake social security numbers. So do not use um, all zeros or ones or some combination of one, two, three, all the way through. Do not enter in fake social security number information. Um, a question about what do you do with outpatient clients that you put on the wait list before it was decided outpatient wasn't required? Um, you can still use the wait list on any services to manage any folks that are waiting. So um, simply process them through, and if you want to continue, if you find benefit in using the wait list process and also want to be able to make sure you've got information in there once we roll out the um, summary reports with our April updates, uh, then keep placing them on there and that will give you more information for your agency to use about wait times and about um, the number of people that you have waiting for services, again, as you're having those contract conversations with your region. And so we have a question about on the spreadsheet, put the total number on the wait list and the total number that were region eligible. Now um, what we're working to build with our vendor is a report that will actually summarize all of that information based upon the wait list entry of information. So again, um, looking to have some efficiency within the reports that we're able to build um, through you putting individuals on the wait list. And funding region is, in fact, the region who will be funding that service for that individual. If we receive a referral, assess the client, and deem them either ineligible or inappropriate, is it expected that we will put them on the wait list, or do we only place people on the wait list that are eligible and appropriate? If someone is appropriate for the service but not eligible for DBH funding and other funding is going to have to be used or they're Medicaid eligible, so place them on the wait list if they are appropriate for that service level. But if they are found that the, the service level is not appropriate for them, regardless of if they're eligible or not, you would not place them on a wait list for that service type. The priority number um, is going to come from, again, a summary of the individuals. So make sure that you are selecting the appropriate priority type for um, the individual as you're placing them onto the wait list so that when that summary report is created, it will be accurate to represent those um, that are priority status on your wait list. 
For the assessment date, do we use the date the psychiatrist gave the diagnosis, the date we received the diagnosis, or when we met with the person and with the diagnosis, we determined they were eligible for our services. So the eligible for services would be that wait list confirmation date um, when you're placing them on the wait list. As far as the assessment date to be used, my understanding is it would be the date that that assessment was made by the psychiatrist, regardless of when that information was offered to you. Again, to be able to speak to the relevance or how current that diagnosis would have been made through the assessment. Right, and, and I think, Heather, you know, the important thing is there is the diagnosis, but there's also, for example, on the mental health for the rehab option services, there would have to be documentation of the functional impairments. Um, so, it's, you know, there, that should be documented in, in one place. So, another question do we have to have the assessment done before we add them to the waitlist for community support services? And that would be, again, you would have to have them deemed eligible, um, clinically eligible um, for the service. So we don't want you to put somebody on the wait list who has not yet been determined um, eligible via um, diagnosis and or functional impairment established. Again, if you have questions about what services are required for the wait list, Again, please reference um, this document and the service list of required services. Again, this training and also the PowerPoint um, will be available this afternoon. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Um, for region folks who um, we have a region super user call, we'll go ahead and we'll call in at 1015, just to give a couple of minutes to close out some questions here. We have a question about how long you should wait to remove a consumer from the wait list if they cannot be located. Um, some of that might have to just be kind of your judgment call. It might be influenced by how many people you have on your wait list um, and whether or not that's creating obstacles for other people getting in. If you're not being able to make contact with someone for an extended time period, you can always remove them from the wait list and then add them later. That was one of the options um, that's in there. So you might not want to remove them completely from the CDS, but you may want to remove them from your wait list if a few weeks pass or even a couple weeks, depending on your circumstances, without being able to make contact with someone. Um, but certainly it's reasonable to understand that um, the number of times that you're attempting to make contact within a given week also would likely influence that decision making. So if you've got questions with that, your region super users might have preferences as well. So we would encourage you to talk with them to be able to make sure that you're falling into compliance with what their expectations are as well. If you don't have all of the information, still place people onto the wait list with as much information as you have. You can go back to the wait list tab as more information becomes available um, and as information maybe needs to be updated. If clients are Medicaid funded, um, you may use the unique identifier in order to um, place them on there. If you're not sure if they're going to be division funded or Medicaid funded, um, say it's someone who has said that they're losing their Medicaid eligibility, you can enter the information in there um, and then update as necessary. You are always able to update the first name and the last name. So again, if you ever wanted to come back and sort of counter some of that information that had previously been placed in there, you could do that. Um, if, in fact, it did turn out that they were Medicaid funded. Um, the other thing is um, that if they become DDH funded, it would save you some time then on the back end being able to put in the rest of the information. So use your good judgment on what to do in cases that might sort of be on the fence 
Um, but certainly, again, as you talk with your legal representations and have confidence in, and feel safe in putting that information there, you certainly can as well. So we have a question, if a client is coming, for example, from Region 6 to Region 4 for a service, um, do you put them in as Region 4 funding even though you may not have yet gotten Region 4 approval? So if someone's coming from Region 6 to a Region 4 service, you really need to work through the region contacts to be able to gain those approvals prior to charging them for the service. So you'll want to make sure that you've got that approval um, already up front in order to select that appropriate funding region. Um, and that is one of the things that if at any time um, maybe you didn't at first have that approval and then you need to submit a data issue to change the funding region at a later point, once that approval had been made, you could do that as well. Um, regardless of where they're coming from and where they're going, you would want to place them on the wait list. All right, well, I want to thank everyone so much for joining us today on the call. Um, we very much appreciate um, your time and um, in advance for the work that you have been doing and learning the, the system, the CDS system, and all of the different functionality within it, as well as your work. Um, if you've not yet begun, again, no later than April 1st for those required services. Um, if you have questions, please seek out the resources within um, the CDS system documentation and training, or you can contact us at the division, or you can send a question through the help desk. So thank you very much, and we appreciate your time today. Have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye.